I think we can get started. All right, well, hello everyone and welcome to um, our Reliability of the Bible webinar. My name is Ray Choi. I am a pastor here in Evanston and I've been a college minister for years. And uh, this is an exciting topic for me. Um, I was a history major. And so the historicity and reliability of the Bible was a big question of mine when I was in college. Uh, while I introduce myself and um, hand it off to JD, uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat bar if you would so like. Um, say a hi and even a hometown from where uh, you are joining us from. All right, so I gave my intro and JD, why don't you take it away? Hi everyone, I'm JD. Uh... I think similar to Ray, I was a history major. I graduated from Berkeley, uh, for those of you who don't know me. And um, I think this topic was also really near and dear to my heart as well. Freshman year, I came into college and I grew, well, I grew up in the church. I think in many ways, I always had this burning question of, can I trust the Bible, uh, given that everything that it purports to have happened happened 2000 years ago? And so I think today's topic is really interesting because it attempts to get at that question. Can you trust the Bible? Can you actually trust what happened uh, over 2,000 years ago? And uh, with that in mind, what we're going to be covering today are three different aspects uh, or three different arguments for this uh, topic uh, to help answer that question. Now, these arguments aren't all of the arguments. There's actually quite a lot across the spectrum because this is actually a huge topic in history uh, but we're going to be covering three in their archaeology a bibliographical analysis and external sources and eyewitness accounts and so as we go throughout today's talk uh, what you'll see is a lot of it is actually brought to you by videos from several different apologists uh, and other resources that i found online because i think that's a lot more engaging for this format uh, as we go throughout this talk as well if questions do come up feel free to use the q a button you'll see that at the bottom bar of your screen at any time just ask the question it'll be queued up for me and ray to go through at different points throughout the series so without further ado uh, we will continue so the first topic is going to be archaeology. Uh, archaeology is actually, I think, one of my most favorite because really what it shows is that the Bible is founded on real people and real places. And with that, we're going to watch two videos on Old Testament in archaeology and New Testament in archaeology. The Old Testament being the Jewish Bible, if you would, and the New Testament being the actual story of Jesus. So here we right, go. Let's do this. Is there any archaeological support of the Old Testament? Well, actually, there's hundreds of findings. So, for example, recently an inscription was found of the name Goliath that dates to the place and time of the biblical story. We also found in an ancient stele in the 1990s a reference to the house of David called the Tel Dan inscription. It roughly dates to the place and time that the biblical chronology would suggest. So David was not just a literary figure, he actually existed. Another example is called Hezekiah's Tunnel. This is one of my favorites. In the Old Testament, it describes that King Hezekiah needed to route water outside the city of Jerusalem. So he built this massive tunnel. Well, years ago, towards the beginning of the 1900s, people actually discovered this tunnel. And the architecture of it, since it goes through this hard, like bedrock, is unbelievable. We still don't know to this day exactly how they started from two sides and met right in the middle. I have walked through Hezekiah's tunnel, which is a testament to that story and to the historical existence of Hezekiah. Another example that you've heard of is called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some would say this is the greatest archeological finding of all time. There are multiple caves in the area called Qumran that's in Israel. And they found over 900 different manuscripts or pottery or copper, different shards of different sizes in different places that attest to the Old Testament books and some other books that the Essenes, the community who had them preserved, and then they hid when the Romans were coming in to destroy Jerusalem and beyond. They were discovered in the middle of the 20th century. And just one finding is called the Great Isaiah Scroll. Now the scroll dates to about 100, 150 BC, which means this was written down before the New Testament. So we have the prophecies of Jesus being born of a virgin, of Jesus doing miracles, etc., long before the New Testament was written. 
but it also showed we had the Dead Sea Scrolls. Before then, we had what was called the Masoretic Text. There was about a thousand year gap. And this was a thousand years earlier than any copy we had. So the question was, how close was the Masoretic Text from the Dead Sea Scrolls? And in the book of Isaiah, it was over 99% the same. And the differences were just words that had changed in meaning over time. This is a remarkable find that says the Old Testament has been preserved reliably. There's many other findings of this, and there's some things we haven't yet found. But as a whole, the archaeological remains are one powerful way of saying we can trust. Sorry for right. the erupt ending, but. That's all right. Yeah, just a quick intro on uh, who's speaking. His name's Sean McDowell, and um, we're going to see a couple more videos, I believe, from him. He's a professor at Biola University in Southern California, and I had the opportunity to take a couple classes from him. So really appreciate him putting all, the, all this research together in these great videos. All right. So next up on the list is a New Testament in archaeology, uh, which I think is even more interesting. And again, if you have questions during any of this, if anything sparks your, uh, a question comes to mind as you're listening to something and you're like, what is that? You can go ahead and ask that in the Q&A box. What's the best archaeological support for the Bible? You know you can get entire books and take whole courses on archaeology we found from the beginning of the Bible all the way through the end. But let's focus down just on the life of Jesus. Here's a few to keep in mind. When you read in John chapter 5, it describes this miracle that Jesus did by the pool of Bethesda. And it describes five porticos, like colonnade structures. You know, for years, skeptics said this is wrong. It couldn't happen. Jesus couldn't have healed somebody who was there because this is not how structures were done. But when the town of Bethesda was excavated, guess what they found? They found a structure exactly like Jesus describes. Here's another example. The high priest who oversaw part of the trial against Jesus is named Caiaphas. Do you know we have the bone box of Caiaphas? He's not just a literary figure. He's not a literary fiction. Caiaphas was a real historical person. Another example, Pontius Pilate, who's the Roman governor who oversaw the trial and condemned Jesus to death. People doubted the existence of Pilate for years because all we had was so-called literary evidence. But now we actually have an inscription from Caesarea pointing to Tiberius and the governor Pontius Pilate. Another example is skeptics often doubted that Jesus was actually crucified by nails, as John reports where Thomas says, I want to see the nails in his hands and the nails in his feet. Crucified victims we found had all been crucified with a rope. But then in dating to the late 20s in Palestine, the body of the remains of a man who's been named Yehohanan was found and he was crucified with about an 11.5 centimeter spike through his heel. Now, what does that show? That doesn't show that Jesus was crucified, but it shows that the biblical account, written long before the archeological remains appeared, described the way people were actually crucified at that time. There are many, many more examples, but the archeological support is one powerful way of showing that the Bible as a whole and the story of Jesus is actually true. So, right. I, yeah, I, I really enjoyed those videos and I enjoy it because, and what I have on the screen here is I took some from the last video of the New Testament and it's four of the ones that he referenced, but there's actually quite a lot. Uh, but the four that he referenced were the Pilot Stone, uh, which was created around 30, uh, CE, CE stands for Common Era. Uh, it's the new term in history these days. Tal Dan Stella, which was found, which was created around 800 BCE before the Common Era. Pool of Bethesda, uh, Caiaphas's ossuary, which is essentially a coffin uh, that they would put uh, the bones of ancient leaders in. All these four things were discovered, and what makes them so great is they all have an inscription. They all have something to do with the New Testament. And so one thing I want to be really sensitive about on the topic of archaeology, 
uh, as we start to craft this argument around the reliability of the Bible, is archaeology itself isn't confirming that the events of the Bible are true. It doesn't confirm that Jesus uh, was crucified. It doesn't confirm uh, a whole bunch of different, you know, how the events are actually strung together in the actual story that you would find in the New Testament. Uh, but what it does confirm for us is at the very least, at the foundation of the Bible, the Bible is founded on real people and real places. And I think that's really important as we talk about the reliability of the Bible, because it gives us a foundation to actually base everything else off of. It allows us to say, okay, um, while we haven't yet talked about the events, at the very least, you can trust that the Bible is founded in reality, and it's not a mythical creation. It's not a literary creation uh, that's just crafting some story of mythological, fictional places. It's actually crafting a story about real people. And with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Uh, or if Ray, you have any comments? Yeah, yeah. Just so just a reminder, the Q and A button is there on the bottom. Please go ahead and submit any questions. Uh, we'll try to answer those uh, that we can. Um, yeah, I really like that point you made, JD. That you know, archaeology doesn't prove everything in the Bible in terms of the story. Um, happen, but at least it tells us it's based on real people, real events. I remember hearing um, and reading in one of the, the books on this that, you know, people were critics of um, every, pretty much everything. The skeptical scholars were skeptical about the existence of David until they found uh, the David inscription. And they're skeptical about, about everything until they find some piece of evidence. But as archaeology developed over the years and more and more findings were uh, appearing, um, the the burden, uh, I guess the, the common assumption in archaeology became that the Bible could, was reliable. Um, the, it should just be considered reliable, even though they haven't found a particular, you know, item or inscription yet. That's how, that's how much um, the, the reliability of the Bible as a historical document shifted over time from just assumption that it's not true until we find something and then it shifted to no we can actually rely on it to to direct us where to dig and you know what what the culture was like back then so all right uh we have do we, we do have a question um the question is what about the early events uh oh sorry let me answer this live so, uh, so i think you can see the question now what about the early events with no archaeological findings adam eve and noah yeah what do you, do you want to comment on that first, JD? I I would say I think it's true. Uh, it's hard to find the old ancient archaeological events uh, in terms of things that we see on the screen here. I can say there is a lot of study devoted to it, and I have read some things, uh, but the verdict is still out because it's not super conclusive. But there's some on the scientific side, uh, which does reference a time when the Earth seemed to be covered in a lot of water. So that's Noah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there's some of that going on in archaeology that you see in the fossil record when you dig down. Um, I would say my answer to it and my gut answer is uh, I think in many ways when you look back, I think if you look at the New Testament and you're just thinking about this logically, you look at the New Testament and as we play out the rest of the day, uh, and there's actually a sister talk to this, which is evidence for the resurrection. Uh, but if you can come to this belief that Jesus has really uh, died and raised again, and if you come to this belief that Jesus said who he said he was, uh, he actually relied heavily on the Old Testament and his teachings. And I think it's there that you actually start to find assurances of, uh, and you start to have comfort in some of the things that happened in the very beginning of the Bible, which is where mm -hmm. Adam and Eve and Noah come out in the book mm -hmm. of Genesis. Yeah, that's a really good point. And so I would just, the only thing I would add is, um, I think just, a minimal answer is, yeah, archaeology does not um, give us answers um, in terms of physical evidence for everything in the Bible. And I think the further back you go in the timeline, then the less and less uh, we will have available to us. So archaeology, archaeology is uh, just a, a one angle of um, developing reliability. Uh, can we trust the Bible? It's, it's a limited angle. But I think as we go on in the presentation, thankfully, it's not the only angle. So. Yeah, that's all I would have to add. All right. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're ready to move on to the next video. I, th I think we are too. One thing I wanted to throw in as well, and this is just, um, this is a short plug, but I work for an Israeli company 
and many of my coworkers are from Israel, and some of my colleagues here in the U.S. have actually gone to Israel as well. And I think one of the awesome things that we can't appreciate when we look at these pictures is actually how awesome it is to, to see them in real life. And that's the stories that I hear over and over again when I hear of people who have gone to Israel, not only my colleagues uh, that I work with, but also people uh, that I've known who are Christian who go and they visit all these holy sites and they see the pool of Bethesda and they, they go visit and see the pilot stone. And for them, it's a mind blowing experience because it really does click for you when you see it all in real life. It's like, this is actually real things. It's not a story a that I thing. grew up yeah. listening to, but it's a real thing, a real place. And so I just wanted yeah. to share that with you. Cause I find that so interesting. Yeah. But maybe we all, maybe we all have that? that chance one day to make that trip. <laughs> Yes. So with that, we can go ahead and cover the next topic, which is bibliographical analysis. Uh, this topic is, uh, is interesting as well, because really what it gets behind is this issue that a lot of people have with the Bible. Uh, and it's really the open question of the Bible was written, and I'm going to use the New Testament in this case. Um, the New Testament was written 2000, about 2,000 years ago. So over the course of 2,000 years, how can we trust the Bible we have today, the Bible that we read and the one that I have right here, how can we trust that this is what was originally written? And the question is usually inspired by the fact that uh, 2,000 years ago, they didn't have printing presses. They didn't have computer technology that could track where somebody messed up uh, or spell check or any of that. So how do you know that on one level, they didn't mess up in the copying process, and so the Bible we have today is completely wrong because they forgot entire books or entire paragraphs that were really important. And then another level, it's how do we know somebody with a political or religious agenda didn't come in and add entire chunks to the Bible mm -hmm. to make their case? And so that's what this topic really uh, goes behind. And so we're going to be watching a video uh, from an organization called Impact uh, 360, and it's an animated uh, video. And it's just going to dig into how historians uh, not only look at the Bible, but look at a whole bunch of different ancient uh, texts, because each ancient text actually the same question exists to us today. How can we, for example, how can we trust uh, Plato's allegory of the cave? The one that we have today is close to what Plato actually wrote. Uh, how do we trust uh, Homer's Odyssey is what was actually said and recorded way back then. So without further ado, here's the video. All right. Is today's New Testament the same as the original that was written 2,000 years ago? Or has the original been hopelessly lost? After all, not one of the original manuscripts still exists. New Testament critic Bart Ehrman asks, what good is it to say that the original writings of the New Testament were inspired? We don't have the originals. We have only error-ridden copies. And the vast majority of these are centuries removed from the originals and different from them, evidently in thousands of ways. There are more variations among our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. If we can't trust the New Testament, we can't trust what we think we know about Jesus of Nazareth. And there's no such thing as authentic Christianity. Let's look at this more closely. The New Testament and all significant literature from the ancient world is reconstructed into its original form by comparing manuscript copies that have survived. To determine the reliability of this reconstruction, historians ask three questions. How many copies exist? How long is the time gap between when the original was written and when the earliest surviving copy was made? And how significant are the differences between the copies? The experts have more confidence in their reconstruction of the original text when there are lots of copies to work with. The time gap is short, and the differences are relatively insignificant. Historians are confident they have reconstructed the original works of Plato and Homer with a high degree of accuracy. So let's compare these works to the New Testament. We have 219 copies of Plato, 2,300 copies of Homer. But when it comes to the New Testament, we have an overwhelming 5,700 manuscript copies in the original Greek alone. In comparison with the average ancient Greek author, the New Testament copies are well over a thousand times more plentiful. If the average sized manuscript were two and one half inches thick, all the copies of the works of the average Greek author would stack up four feet high, while the copies of the New Testament would stack up to over a mile high. This is indeed an embarrassment of riches. 
But how much time elapsed between the original writings and the earliest surviving manuscript copy? 1,300 years passed before the first surviving copy of Plato was written, and only 400 years for Homer. How about the New Testament? Just 35 years. In the world of ancient literature, this is a blink of an eye. The wealth of material that is available for determining the wording of the original New Testament is absolutely stunning. But these manuscripts are not identical. In fact, they contain roughly 400,000 differences. The obvious question then is, how significant are these variations? Most of them are simply variations in spelling, which are easy to sort out. Then we find minor differences, such as the use of synonyms or a definite article with a proper name. These have no effect on translation. There are also errors that scholars have determined were not in the original text. That means that less than 1% of all the variants have any real significance at all for the meaning of the original text. And none of these, not one, affects a single core doctrine of the Christian faith. Furthermore, in their various writings, early church leaders quoted the New Testament over a million times. So extensive are these citations that if all the other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. The overabundance of early and accurate manuscripts and quotations from those manuscripts combined to make reconstruction of the original Greek text of the New Testament virtually certain. The books of the New Testament you read today are the same as the original writings penned nearly 2,000 years ago. So, oh, that's an awesome video. Yeah. yeah, I really like the uh, animation of it because I think it makes it really clear. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to stress for you guys, uh, just in case you missed it, uh, and we're going to watch another video on the Old Testament now because I think it's only fair to talk about that as well because it's the other half of the Bible. Uh, conceptually, I mean, literally, it's more than half. But uh, one thing I wanted to stress here is the time gap issue. Uh, because I think that's the most phenomenal part of this. It's not only the number of copies uh, where you saw the New Testament has 20, I think it was 22 or 27,000 copies, uh, whereas the next closest was in the hundreds. Um, the time gap was also very big. And the time gap is really important because when you're looking at and comparing all of these sources and putting them together, um, if you, the longer amount of time you have between what when we think the original was actually published and the first copies we have, the longer amount of time, we don't know what happened. And so if it was a thousand year time gap, presumably a lot of changes could have happened, but we would never be able to confirm that. So we might know uh, a thousand years earlier, the text was actually published. We don't know what happened in that thousand year time span until we got our earliest copy. And so when you look at the Bible and you see it was 35 years, that's phenomenal because that's such a short time span. That's within somebody's lifetime we're talking about. And it's not within, you know, multiple lifetimes. And to just put it into perspective, if you look, I'm picking on Plato uh, because of the thousand year gap that you saw in the video. Uh, but a thousand years ago, that's like middle ages. And so you're talking about finding a text from the middle ages, if we're, we're talking about today, and saying, we know a great degree of certainty that that text is originally what that author wrote 1000 years ago. And when you think about it in those kinds of time gaps, it's phenomenal because the time gap is so short for the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just, I want to iterate the point that uh, historians consider Homer and Plato to be uh, of a high degree of reliability. And so um, just taking that as um, like a comparison point, that much more uh, historians stake reliability um, in the biblical text. Um, I, there is a qu one question, JD, I think is worth answering uh, before we watch the Old Testament uh, video. And yep. I'm going to get it up here on the Q&A bar. So it is this, um, is it fair to compare Bible, the Bible to works of Homer, which we assume to be fictional? And it's a great question because I think it really brings out this particular angle of the bibliographical test. So the bibliographical test does not tell us whether something is fictional, uh, actually happened uh, or not, you know, fictional or non-fictional. All, all it's really testing for is did is what we have today the same as what the author originally wrote, whether they're writing a poem, 
or writing uh, an eyewitness account. Uh, and so that's really what the bibliographical test is getting at. And so um, that's what the historians are comparing, just in terms of accuracy of transmission. And so, yeah, his Homer's Iliad, very reliable. Um, and so that much more the New, New Testament uh, is reliable in terms of we have today what was originally written. Um, all right. And I think for, for tracking purposes, just to track, because I like how Ray put that, uh, it's just to test, is it originally what was written? Uh, if you're tracking with the argument that we've been making so far about is the Bible reliable, uh, the first step was establishing that foundation that the Bible is founded on real people in real places. And now we've moved into this realm, okay, great, if we can accept that, what about the actual text itself? Maybe it's real people in real places, but how do we trust that it hasn't changed? And that's what we're attacking now, and we're actually going to start talking more about that third point, which is can we actually trust the events in the next section? But uh, that's to give you the roadmap for those of you who uh, like to know that as we go through the talk. All right. Are we still watching that Old Testament um, bibliographical? Yes. All right. Yes. All right, let's, let's give that a spin, and then there's a couple more questions. I think we can answer them in the next break. How do we know the Old Testament is reliable? It's a big book. In fact, it's actually 39 books. How do we know we can trust it? Well, keep three things in mind as we look at the Old Testament. Number one, we want to look, as we do with any ancient book, is there evidence outside of the book in what we call archaeology? Well, when it comes to the Old Testament, there are many things we simply haven't found because they've been destroyed or they just haven't been tracked down yet. But what we consistently find are archaeological remains that support the story of the Old Testament. So, for example, recently an inscription was found of the name Goliath that dates to the place and time of the biblical story. We also found in an ancient stele in the 1990s a reference to the house of David. I have walked through Hezekiah's tunnel, which is a testament to that story. And of course, we know where Jericho is, where the famous battle took place. So one way we can corroborate the Old Testament is by looking at the archaeological record. The second way, which is remarkable, is the care that the scribes took to copy the biblical record, the Old Testament books from one generation to the next. There's never been a people group in the history of the world that cared about their literature as much as the Jewish people. So for example, when they copied an Old Testament manuscript from one generation to the next, it would be a scribe who had been trained for years. They'd be in a room alone with a certain kind of lighting. They'd use the right kind of animal skin parchment or some kind of papyrus paper. They had to have a special pen. They would write one letter at a time. Let me say that again. One letter at a time. They couldn't memorize a line and repeat it. It was one letter at a time. And in an entire book of the Bible, Isaiah, Psalms, Habakkuk, when they were done, if there were three mistakes or more, they would get rid of the entire manuscript. And they would have people, when they were done, go back through line by line and count exactly how they recorded the book of the Old Testament. Even when it came to the name of God, they wouldn't write the name of God. They would actually just write four dots because they so reverenced God's name. So the scribes were absolutely careful. And we've seen in the Dead Sea Scrolls that they copied this book with almost virtual precision. And this was a thousand years earlier than any copy we had. And just one finding is called the Great Isaiah Scroll. Now, this scroll dates to about 100, 150 BC, which means this was written down before the New Testament. So we have the prophecies of Jesus being born of a virgin, of Jesus doing miracles, etc., long before the New Testament was written. The third way we can know the Old Testament, is, I think, is to look at the teachings of Jesus. So Jesus, who is God in human flesh, believed that the Old Testament was reliable. He believed that it was true. He said, not a jot or tittle will disappear from the law. Jesus believed the Old Testament was true. If he's the son of God, that's good enough for me. So how do we know we can trust the Old Testament? We have a good archeological record. The precision by which it's been copied is unbelievable. And Jesus, who's God in human flesh, believed that it was true. That's the beginning. All right. 
Yeah, if you didn't notice, uh, the that video had a little bit of a rep, repeat from an earlier video, but I think it's good to just get kind of the all the all the reasons uh, in one shot. So, um, all right, um, JD, did you want to make any remarks uh, there before I uh, answer some of the uh, bring up some of the questions? No, I think let's bring up some of the questions and clear that out, and then answer them, uh, and then oh. I can close out a bibliographical analysis. Okay. All right, this one, I just put it up there. Uh, she's asking, so the time gap means that the earliest copies we have are from 35 years after the original was written. And that's exactly what it means. Yeah, the, the, like from the time that uh, Mark sat down and wrote the Gospel of Mark, 35 years after that moment uh, is, when, uh, is when the manuscript was written that we have, for example. Um, all right, and, and then there's another question that's, uh, really helpful, I think, in this discussion. Um, let me get that live. Okay. How do we determine when were the originals published? How do we know it is only 35 years apart if we do not, if we do not have the original copy? So, uh, JD, do you want to um, comment on that one? Yeah, I think some of the answers to this will come out in our next section, which is on uh, historic it's on external sources, uh, which are sources from historians of the era uh, and historians who came after. Uh, so we have some of that. There's a lot of actually work from historians, not only in that era, but who uh, were within several hundred years, uh, who are looking back and studying the time. And so they can approximate the time based on the records and things of that nature uh, when they look back and, and are trying to figure out when they think the life of Jesus actually happened. Um, and what some of how we would do history you... today. Oh, yeah. Yep. Sorry. And one thing I, I could add is uh, in terms of dating, when were the original events and when might that original have been written? Uh, one uh, really um, like a crucial source uh, in, in terms of asking all these questions are external sources or extra biblical sources. So um, there's historians and, and writings by people outside the Bible. Some of them uh, were actually hostile to Christianity, but they're just doing their histo historians work and they, uh, they date and they write about figures during the time of Jesus. And so um, I think that's something that actually might get covered in one of the videos coming up, but extra biblical sources are uh, a huge plus in terms of uh, get, get, filling out the picture of dates as well as reliability. Yep. All right. So, so what's this next section, JD? Uh, this next section, I think we looking at the time so that we can leave a couple minutes at Q&A. I'll cover it really quickly. Um, just to round up bibliographical analysis, uh, I think the way I think people oftentimes get tripped up in it, and they get tripped up in it because they think of it like the telephone game. And so, if any of you have ever played the game when you were in uh, elementary school, it's the idea that somebody says some sort of code word. In this case, it's Chinese food is made of sugar, spice, and lots of rice. Uh, they might say that to the person next to them, and then you go around in a circle all the way to the end, and you see is the last person carrying the same message uh, that was passed down from the first person. And oftentimes, what you find as you go down this this a route is the message will change. And so that's what I attempted to show here with the black underlined word is things would change. And then as it changes, those changes get picked up at each stage as you go along. And so sometimes it's the same change, but just repeated. Sometimes it's another word that gets thrown in, like in the last step consists of, and then pretty soon you get to the end and sometimes it's really different. Why that difference often happens is, you know, sometimes it's uh, people, it's kids and most likely uh, young boys who are looking to be mischievous and trying mm -hmm. to change. Uh, things for the fun of it. And then sometimes it's because people don't hear things properly. And so this is what trips us up when we think about bibliographical analysis is we think like this, how can we trust the Bible? They've copied it over so many years and these same mistakes have been repeated over so many years that the whole thing could be very different. When in reality, and this is what you saw in the video, is it's not one-to-one -one copying like the telephone game, it's one-to-many copying. And so you have all these different copies being made around the same time, and then copies of those copies being made all in different areas and locations. And as we collect all of those together, we can not only compare things around the same era. So if you look at the third level, everything consists of, and then one is not changed. You look at those and you start to compare what are the differences between those, and then you compare them to the differences between the ones that we're pretty sure came before them. And so by looking at all these and comparing all of them together, you eventually can arrive at a pretty certain uh, version of 
of what was originally written. And that's what the mm -hmm. video was purporting to show. Yeah, and just, just um, to um, add on to this uh, diagram, this diagram, although it explains it, it, it does a little leave me a little unnerved because, um, wow, if with only three copies and one of them says everything, the other says, so how confident can we be? But like we heard, um, there's over 5,000 copies of the New Testament. So the variations we're talking about is like, you know, over 90 some percent, you know, have one version and then there's just a few that have some others. And so because of that, because of the vast number of manuscripts, we can have a high degree of confidence of what, what the original uh, version was. So, yeah. All right. And with that, I can say to close this out, uh, I took a history class on the history of Christianity. And one of the first things the professor did, and she's not a Christian by any means, um, she's a secular scholar, uh, just studying Christianity in a historical context. Uh, one of the first classes she asked, can we trust the Bible as a historical source? Most of the class laughed and scoffed and said, what? Sort Like, no, no way. And she scolded all of us as a class because it was about 30 of us. And we had an entire lesson on why the Bible is one of the most trusted, and I stress that, the most trusted historical sources uh, for the ancient era. Uh, more so than Plato, more so than Homer, as you saw in the video, more so than anything else we have to tell us what ancient life was like, especially in uh, the areas of Palestine and modern day Israel. Wow. I love Berkeley yeah. professors. <laughs> they say it as it is. <laughs> All right. Many people were shocked. So uh, but this is the last sec segment we're coming up on, right, JD? Yep, last segment. And so this is the eyewitness accounts and external sources that Ray was talking about. Um, we're gonna be watching a video on, um, from Jay Warner Wallace. And Ray, you wanted to say a couple words about him? Oh yeah, just a quick intro. He was um, not, he did not grow up a Christian. He became Christian later in life. And his professional career was as a cold case homicide detective. And at the age of 35, um, using his detective skills, he investigated the reliability of the Bible. And at the end of his investigation, um, he became a Christian. And so he wrote this book called Cold Case Christianity. Uh, I re recommend it and we're gonna be hearing from him. Great. <laughs>When I first started to look at Scripture, New Testament, I, I didn't have really any background in Christianity, didn't really even know what I was going to find. And as I read through the Gospels, I was struck by a texture of each Gospel that was so familiar to me as it's so similar to the kind of texture I would see when I read supplemental reports that are written by detectives who are interviewing witnesses in a crime. I, I noticed right away, for example, that, that witnesses never, ever agree. On any case I've ever worked, there's always what appear to be contradictions between the eyewitness accounts, and they're at a certain kind of level, a certain texture, a certain, a certain uh, um, ethos that I see in the accounts. I, I started to see that as I was reading the Gospels. I said, wow, these really feel like they have the degree of variation that I expect to find between reliable eyewitness accounts. But I thought, could these really be eyewitness accounts? Well, if they are, they have to pass four things, a test that I apply to all eyewitness accounts. It's really a test that is written out in almost every set of jury instructions in America for any criminal trial. The questions are, were the witnesses really there to see what they said they saw? Um, can they be verified or corroborated, even in some small way? Um, have they been honest and accurate over time without changing their story? And finally, did they possess a bias that would cause them to lie? I needed to know if the authors of the Gospels could pass the test in those four categories. And so I simply started to dig in to determine how early were these written? Were they written early enough to have been written by eyewitnesses in front of others who would know if the stories were lies? I think there's more than enough reason to believe they were written early enough to have been written by eyewitnesses. Can they be corroborated by something? Maybe, I don't know, the other statements of non-Christians early in history or archaeology or internal evidences that would tell us if the authors are accurately describing events in the first century? I thought that that was actually a, a reasonable inference also from the evidence. Have they changed
changed over time? Well, if you track the narratives of the Gospels as they are transmitted from eyewitness to students, say John to Polycarp and Papias and Ignatius to his, their students, Irenaeus to his student, Hippolytus, if you follow the, the, the course of history and examine what is being said about Jesus, it doesn't change. These are early accounts that don't change. And if you look at, you know, uh, um, the bias, what potential bias, there's only three reasons why anyone lies about anything. That's for money, uh, sex, or power. That's it. Every crime I've ever worked is driven by one of those three motives. What is driving the disciples if they're lying to us? If they're lying, they're only lying for one of those three reasons. Well, what, what do they get out of this? I think in the end, I, I really realized that I've got to come to grips with this Jesus of Nazareth. The stories, the eyewitness accounts that are offered in the Gospels, they pass the test as well as any ancient account about anyone. The only thing that's left to do is decide, well, how am I going to respond? Once you determine that an eyewitness is telling you something true, the only thing left for the investigator is to do something with what he's just learned. So for me, the question was, if this is true, now what am I going to do with it? And that's the question that you have to ask yourself as well. All right. Well, wow. he, he, really, he really speaks from a place of authority, having been a detective all those years and running, it, running Christian writings through the same test that he used in his, in his practice in criminal law. Really appreciate his work. I think one thing I'd throw into, because I realized we forgot to, I think, explain the context of eyewitness and external sources. I mean, we covered external sources earlier, but I think for the eyewitness, what he's trying to get at is this idea, I guess the significance of this is really the idea that uh, it starts to attack this idea, how can we trust it was actually written now? And this is where the, I think it really starts to get interesting. And so the eyewitness account and what he just talked about was, like it's trying to answer the question, how do we know that the disciples, or as we call them now, apostles, like Apostle Peter, Apostle Paul, all these guys, how do we know they didn't lie about the New Testament? How do we know they didn't lie about Jesus' death and resurrection? How do we know? And so what he's talking about is is going through and actually examining uh, both from his own detective work and now this, looking at the New Testament, can we actually trust what they were saying or were they all lying? And one of the most interesting things, if you caught on, uh, is that I find most interesting at least is if they knew they were lying, many of them actually died uh, for their faith. And so it's this weird predicament of uh, if they knew they were lying, they were dying for a lie. And that puts you in a weird position because you know that it's a lie, but you're going to die for it. And it's really interesting because it, it's counter to a lot of other people, a lot of other faiths where people will say, Oh, those people will die for their faith all the time. Like Islam. And it's different because when you actually look at, at people like that, or people today, they didn't actually live in that day. They didn't actually see Jesus rise and die and rise again. They didn't see, or whoever their purported religious figures are, they're just basing it all on faith. These people are actually saying, I saw this happen with my own eyes, and I'm going to die because I know it's true. And that's what this whole eyewitness thing is really getting at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just uh, want to do another uh, invitation for any questions um, as we start to wrap things up here. But yeah, I, I really appreciate the way that uh, JDU arranged this presentation because it kind of takes us from um, the question of, well, what we, what we have today in our hands is, is this uh, the same thing that was written by the authors? Like we said before, it doesn't prove that what the original author wrote was true. All, the, all that archaeology and the bibliographical tests can give us confidence for is at least what they wrote didn't change. And now for this last test about eyewitnesses and external sources um, and motives, that's actually hitting the question. Um, well, if we have what they originally written, how do we know what they originally wrote was, was true? So it, it's kind of fit, fitting like a, a more complete piece of, uh, a, a, you know, complete picture of the puzzle. All right. Um, let's see. All right, I have a couple questions here. Um, JD, did you have any other anything else before we this final Q and A time, uh, or is this is this our last? The lap? next is let's. Uh, I think let's put the questions on hold and just finish the material. It's the last bit on external sources, and I think it's just very interesting um, for our own enrichment. 
on this topic. All right. Uh, but good. what this Let's really is getting at, yeah, what external sources is really getting at, and Ray referenced it earlier, uh, and if we can imagine for a moment, let's just say we throw the whole Bible out the window, uh, figuratively speaking, uh, and we say, we're not going to trust the Bible because who knows if you can even trust it. But what's interesting is you have these key external sources. These are people who are not Christian. Uh, some of them are Romans. Some of them are Jewish. Uh, but you have all these different people who are looking back on this era, uh, both who have lived in that era and later, and saying, this is what has happened in history. So they're like historians, just writing down, recording. And oftentimes it's actually in a book that's not on Christianity even. It's just on general Roman history. Uh, they're actually writing things like this. And so this is Flavius Josephus. He writes something to this effect. At this time, there's a wise man who is called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. And those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. And so you see everything from this level of detail, uh, which almost sounds like, I mean, it's an exact summary of basically the gospel uh, in the New Testament in a way. And you have this level all the way down to just references of Jesus, of Nazareth, and this guy who claimed to be God and all this stuff being written into history. And it's interesting because it's showing us this actually did happen. I mean, people, it was, it was such a significant event that other people who are no friends to Christianity were actually recording it because they thought it was significant enough to write down. And what I find really interesting, and I get this from, uh, I'll show you the resource at the end. I can't find my book, uh, or it's this book right here, Questioning the Bible, 11 Major Challenges. Uh, but he went through, uh, Jonathan Morrow, who's the author, went through and actually took a survey of all of this history. And what, you can, be, what can be derived without even looking at the Bible from all of these different sources is this list. And so I'm not going to read it, but I'll leave it up on screen so you can answer some of these questions. Uh, but it goes through everything. It basically describes every act, every major act in the New Testament that happened around the life of Jesus. All right. Thank you, JD. Okay. We do want to end before the top of the hour. Um, I think we have time for one of the questions up here. So I just put it up. Can we trust the canonization of the Bible? That's a great question. Uh, the word canon uh, or the process of canonization. Canon comes from the uh, the word uh, reed, like a, a reed, um, the plant. And uh, it was used as a kind of the standard uh, of what's straight and reliable. Um, so in terms of what is the reliable Bible, it's referring to the choosing of which books get to be considered part of the Bible. Um, 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 unfortunately, we don't have uh, nearly enough time to get into that. Um, but Maybe that could be a next, uh, a, a future webinar topic. Um, I actually uh, took a class that focused a lot on that and I love that topic. Um, I'll try to give like a 10 second answer. Um, people have the misconception that canonization was a group of powerful religious folks who decided what goes in the Bible um, by their own agenda. And it, what actually happened was the, the reliable books of the Bible were um, accepted by the community and those original eyewitnesses. And that just got passed down generation after generation. So by the time that we have the first list of books in the Bible, it was pretty much what the church had accepted for generations. So it was nothing new. Um, that's my short version. Um, so I think that's, that is all the time we have for. Um, and uh, I think JD had one more slide with resources. If you are just interested in learning more about this or reading it for yourself, um, there are some good resources we want to recommend to you. Yep. So, and if you do have any other questions, I mean, we do have about uh, five minutes left. So uh, if you want to stay on or ask them, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but these are some good resources. So I mentioned this one already, questioning the Bible, 11 major challenges to the Bible's authority. You can see it on the screen. Uh, it's really good. It's actually, for those of you who are not historians, uh, or if you're like me and you don't like, you don't always like to read dry, boring history, uh, even though I was a history major, uh, this book is really nice and it's an easy, simple read and you could probably finish it within a day uh, or sooner, probably within a couple hours because it's just nicely well laid out and it asks 11 big questions that I think are interesting. Uh, course 101, 
if you are interested in it and you haven't done it, actually some of these materials that I covered today are found in Course 101, uh, as well as a lot of other different resources, not only on the history of the Bible, but on uh, the resurrection and on just what a, what a Christians even believe to begin with. And so if you're interested in that, go ahead and contact one of our staff mentors or just reach out to us after this talk. And the last one is if you just really like to watch videos because back to you and you're like, I got nothing else to do. Sean McDowell has many different videos on his website, seanmcdowell.org, uh, that are in line with what we saw today. All right. Okay. Um, I think that's it. There is one last question that I think is, is more for... Um, Kind of dinner table talk. Uh, I think they're asking for the shortest. I mean, let me get it here. You didn't think I would answer this, huh? But I'm going to try. The shortest historical figure in the Bible. And, um, you know, we don't have archaeological evidence for this, but there was, um, there, there is, oh gosh, I'm forgetting his name. There was someone, oh, well, first of all, there's Nehemiah. Nehemiah. He's as tall as your knees. And then there's, um, I'm forgetting his first name, but he was something, the shoe height. So he's actually even sh shorter because he's a shoe height. And, um, and then there's actually the, it was someone even shorter. It was Peter because he slept on his watch. So he's, he's only actually about that tall. He slept on his watch. So uh, that concludes our webinar. Thank you for your laughter, JD. I can't tell if anyone else is laughing. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed our webinar. We're going to have uh, more coming up in, over the rest of this quarter and the summer. And I uh, hope that tonight's material just stimulated your thoughts. And just um, thankful you're all asking these questions and can share this knowledge with uh, people you know. So, all right. I think that we're done. And uh, one last comment uh, for those of you, uh, if you have friends who you think this would be really good for, we'll be posting a recording on the Make New uh, Facebook page. Yep, that's right. All right, everyone have a good night. Thank you.